Hello and welcome to News Clip. We are in conversation today with D. Raghunandan of Delhi Science Forum and we will be discussing the Indus Waters Treaty between India and Pakistan, especially in the context of uh, recent reports that India is considering a rethink about the treaty, believedly because of uh, some apprehensions that India has about Pakistan's intentions uh, in the aftermath of the strike on the Indian military camp in Uri. Uh, so, Raghu, welcome to this clip. Uh, can you just take us uh, briefly through the genesis of this Indus Waters Treaty and what implications it has for both Pakistan and India? Broadly speaking, the Indus Water Treaty governs the utilization of the five rivers of the Punjab mm -hmm. and the parent river, the Indus. Mm -hmm. And what the treaty does is to divide up these six rivers into the eastern rivers which largely flow through India and the western rivers which largely flow through Pakistan. And almost the entire Pakistani agriculture depends on the Indus and its uh, distributaries. And when did this treaty actually this get? This treaty was almost 50 years old. Mm -hmm. and it 1960. Was, that's right. And it was a bilateral treaty between India and Pakistan, but using the good offices of the World Bank. So how did the World Bank get involved? Well, partly it was because India and Pakistan knew that they were two states in conflict with each other and that a bilateral uh, treaty just between the two of them may not uh, survive the tests of time and tension between the two countries. So the two countries asked the World Bank to come into the picture also because both the countries in their plans for utilization of these rivers were also going to the World Bank for concessional uh, finance. So World Bank seemed to be to both the countries an honest broker if you like. So the education is now international. It is now international in the sense that you've got the World Bank sitting there and either of the parties can approach the World Bank if they feel that the terms of the There is a treaty, tribunal. Uh, there is a tribunal and there is a formal treaty between these two uh, countries and for a long time it has actually been held that despite the obvious tensions between these two countries which run through the year uh, and has been running through for the past 50 years, in fact ever since independence. But the Indus Water Treaty has survived armed conflicts, two wars. Despite them, the Indus Water Treaty has continued. Both the countries have abided by it. And recently when Pakistan felt uh, over the Kishan Ganga barrage that India was violating the treaty, it took India to the Arbitration Council which finally ruled in favor of India. So both the countries so far have been going along with the terms of the treaty and have been behaving well. Is it correct to uh, say that uh, actually Pakistan is uh, more dependent on the treaty being governed properly? Uh, than India because as you were saying earlier that agriculture in Pakistan is largely dependent on these rivers. And the second and most important reason is that all these rivers uh, flow through India before they enter Pakistan mm -hmm. uh, as far as the western rivers are concerned. But the eastern rivers are entirely flowing through India except for parts of their origin in Tibet. Uh, so Pakistan is dependent on good behavior by India as a responsible upper riparian state for the waters flowing properly through into the Punjab, uh, into West Punjab. Currently, um, when India says that it's doing a rethink about the treaty, uh, in functional terms, what does it mean? What, what are India's options and what could it do? The first thing I think is that as part of the current uh, mood in New Delhi, where there is a lot of saber rattling uh, going on, daily threats are being issued. This threat of abrogating the Indus Water Treaty is one of these threats mm -hmm. being thrown. Now that's easier said than done and that's what I think very few people realize that it's not just India opting out of uh, the treaty because this is a regular international treaty signed into law by both the countries 
And even if India wants to abrogate the treaty, it has to go through a process of notifying that it wants to do it, bringing the World Bank into the picture. Automatically, this internationalizes the situation. It's not just a bilateral thing. And even more, it cannot be done unilaterally by India uh, at the stroke of a pen. So that's first thing that I think has to be realized about this. Uh, the next step that is being uh, proposed by India is uh, to fiddle with the allocation of waters of the western rivers which flow into uh, Pakistan. Now, what a lot of the noises being made, even the chief minister of Jammu and Kashmir yesterday has said, we are not able to utilize the waters of the western rivers so, properly. So that's, that's my question yeah. to you, that uh, on one hand, uh, you have uh, apparently an intention uh, to somehow uh, retaliate against Pakistan. Yes. But uh, apart from the legal issues, uh, in terms of uh, technically uh, being able to do so, uh, is there, uh, are there any real options immediately available uh, to India that would prevent uh, Pakistan from getting its uh, share of waters according to the treaty? I think we should look at both these aspects. The question of abrogating the treaty first. If India says, here are these western flowing rivers that go into Pakistan, we will stop the water going into Pakistan, which is the kind of threats being made that we'll starve Punjab, uh, West Punjab, we'll prevent the water and Pakistan will collapse. Technically, that is not feasible. You can't stop a river flowing. That's what I'm asking. Stop, so what, what, what can India do? Exactly. So if you want to stop the western flowing rivers, you have to create huge amount of infrastructure to be able to utilize those waters in India. Currently, if you stop the waters, you will flood uh, part of Your own most land. of Jammu and Punjab. So you will actually harm yourself uh, by flooding, just as you think you will harm Punjab, the west Punjab by starving it of uh, water. That's one. Second part is, there is a provision in the Indus Water Treaty as far as the western flowing rivers are concerned. India western can... Western flowing be, means the ones through Means the Pakistan. one that is going to Pakistan. Means that India can use up to 20% mm -hmm. of the waters, mostly for non-consumptive purposes. That is to say, you can use it for hydropower, uh, and such things, whereas your use for irrigation should be minimized. Otherwise, you'll just exhaust the uh, waters. But up to 20% of the waters can be used even within the framework of the treaty. So I think if at all India is considering... Are we, are we doing that? Uh, we are not doing. Uh, do, uh, I understand not anywhere near... Uh, all, nowhere near. near, nowhere near. And why India has never tapped these waters over the last 50 years is I think a million dollar uh, question when large parts of Jammu are in need of irrigation water. But I think answers for this must be looked at in terms of the lack of development of the whole state of Jammu and Kashmir mm. since independence. And it's not just in river waters that development has not taken place. Development has not taken place in railways, in infrastructure, in roads and so on. And this is one more area where India has not invested in the development of Jammu and Kashmir to the extent it should. So, so do you think this is an empty threat? The abrogation of the River Waters Treaty, I think, is an empty threat. So uh, isn't waters. it uh, a bit curious that while within the country, disputes between riparian states uh, keep flaring up, but for 66, uh, about, um, how much, about 56 years, uh, between India and Pakistan, we don't seem to have had that kind of a dispute. Precisely my point is that this has been the strength of the Indus Water Treaty. Precisely because there is a codified arrangement between two countries which governed the utilization of these rivers. There is an arbitration body, whatever you may think about it, which sits there to which both can appeal and whose decisions are binding on both the parties. There is an institutional arrangement. Unfortunately, within the country, India has so far not come to any solid institutional arrangements which guide interstate disputes on river waters. And that's why we are still floundering with it. So I would think, in fact, that we should be copying measures institutionalized in the Indus Water Treaty, using those to govern domestic interstate 
relations governing river waters rather than talking of abrogating Indus water treaties, which I think have stood the test of time. Thank you. Thank you, Raghu, for talking to us. We'll be back on News Click on more about this issue later. Thanks for being with us.